Welcome to Open Your Eyes to the Universe. I'm Gabriel Martin, and it's a pleasure to have you with us again for another episode. If you're joining for the first time, a very warm welcome. Thanks for coming along. It's lovely to have you with us. Now, the Universe team would like to acknowledge Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the traditional custodians of the land upon which we meet. And we pay respect to the elders of the past, the present and future, and acknowledge their spiritual connection to country. And we also acknowledge and respect the wise elder within us all and the collective wisdom of all those here this evening. Open Your Eyes to the Universe is a series of contemporary talks, conversations, open-eyed meditations and interviews with people who inspire and uplift others <clears throat> just by sharing their wisdom, their insights and their experiences with us. So last month, you might recall that on Universe, we were in conversation with performing artist Carmen Warrington, known as the Voice of Peace. And we were exploring being calm and creative. Some of you have asked to listen to it again, and others of you were unable to access the YouTube link on the night. So just be sure that you've got it. We'll place it in the chat box now for you. But here we are this evening, and we're in the company of three people living on the other side of our world. Sonia Olsen in Denmark, Valerian Bernard in France, and Carolyn Froud in Germany. All three are daily meditation practitioners, and each of them has a very deep commitment to protecting our environment globally. And they are active as environmental change agents. So as such, they're very well placed to lead us in our topic this evening, which is called guardianship of our environment. You know, like it's been seen that long lasting change in any social or environmental system starts with a profound shift in the minds and hearts of people. The current environmental crisis is a clear call to action, a call to transform our awareness and lifestyle. So what does it take to care for our earth, like really care for our earth? What's the connection between our consciousness, our thoughts and our actions? and their impact on our world. And in particular, the connection between my consciousness and what's happening in our global environment. And what's meditation got to do with it all? Well, we're going to unpack some of this tonight. And, and I'll briefly introduce our speakers. Sonia Olson has been practicing and teaching Raj Yoga meditation for about 35 years. And she's been involved in the United Nations Federation Convention on Climate Change Conferences for at least 10 years or so. Valerian Bernard is the representative for the Brahma Kumaris of the United Nations in Geneva. She's also a contributing member in climate change conferences and is active in the Interfaith Liaison Committee with the UNFCCC Secretariat. Our third guest is Carolyn Froud. Now, Carolyn works in a transdisciplinary research group at the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, Germany. Her research interests include designing processes and spaces, engaging with people's beliefs, values, worldviews, emotions and intentions, understood as leverage points for transformation towards a sustainable society. She's been actively involved in COP conferences since around 2013. So that briefly introduces our three guests this evening. And viewers, as always, we really welcome your participation and questions. And thanks to those of you who've sent them in already. But for those who'd like to ask a question and haven't been able to do so yet, please feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll, we'll pose it to our guests at some point this evening. So Sonia, Valerian and Carolyn, it's a pleasure to have each of you with us tonight particularly as I know how full your schedules are at the moment as you prepare for COP26 conference on climate change in Glasgow, which I think starts in about next week, isn't it? So thanks for taking some time out to join us in this part of the world, which we often refer to as Down Under. A very warm welcome to you all to Down Under. Lovely to see you waving. Yes, indeed. Well, look, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to introduce in more detail our first speaker. So that's Sonia. She's the director of the Brahma Kumaris in Denmark and has practiced and taught Raj Yoga meditation since 1986. She's a meditation teacher with the prison service in Copenhagen. In 2009, she was instrumental in developing the Brahma Kumaris Environment Initiative 
in order to meet the, high, the need for a higher environmental awareness within the international Brahma Kumaris community. Now that's a big job because there's, uh, the Brahma Kumaris have a presence in over a hundred countries and that includes about 8,500 centers. Now, Sonia adds the inner dimension to the discussions at the UN Climate Change and Biodiversity Conferences. So, Sonia, it would be great and, and useful to us if you could just outline the Brahma Kumari's contribution to the Conference of Parties over, the, I would say, the last few years, and also share with us what you understand as the connection between our consciousness and the impact our thoughts, our words, and our actions have on the environment. Lovely to hear from you, Sonia. Good morning, everybody from this part of the world. And thank you, Gabriella, for your introduction and invitation. And it's really lovely to be on this program. And I honestly, I'm not sure if I can give myself the title, the guardian of the environment, because there are many things I'm not able to do right. But I would love to share the things with you that I really found interesting and what lifestyle change I have made and those things I find difficult um, I can take your help with those things. When I uh, first started to engage with the environment it was actually a friend to me here in Copenhagen she said you know what you're thinking have a direct impact on the environment and I said what <laughs> on the weather because often we mixed up climate change and the weather. Now they are very much linked together, but not at that time, like 15 years ago. And I said, how do you explain that? And she said, well, every thought you have create an attitude. So the thoughts, they cluster together and create an attitude. And with that attitude, I look at the world and I make my choices. And for every choice I make, I can either make a choice that supports the environment or destroy the environment. And if you think about it, so many times during the day, we make a small decision, we choose something. Every time I spend a penny, I actually... Uh, decide if I'm going to spend my pennies in something which is more sustainable or not sustainable. And every time you move around, we take a choice to do this or to do that and in a more, more or less sustainable way. So in the end, every time I think, and we think, you know, we think 100,000 thoughts per day, I will actually uh, be part of protecting the environment or destroying the environment. And when I started to engage with the, the environment, I really enjoyed the company of other people who find this link between the inner world and the outer world fascinating. And it's a, such a deep topic to go into. And with a company of other environmentalists, spiritual people, we started to dig deep. And you, you will find, we found that my inner pollution is connected to the pollution out there. And I can see for myself just now, because it's very intense preparing going to COP26 in Glasgow, that some of my good sustainable habits has actually decreased because uh, there's too much to do. So in a way, I can just feel on myself that if you have some bit of stress, you live a less sustainable life. So that's very clear. And... Um, we also found that when you dig deep into this topic, you find how my changing lifestyle also helped in changing worldview. And in 2008, 2017 in Bonn, there was a, the, one of the COP climate change conferences. And there UNESCO had a pavilion which said, and it stated with big letters, change minds not climate. And then I thought, wow, we've come a long way. <laughs> and uh, through the years engaging with the environment, I also found 
this principle of non-separation very, very interesting. And to dig deep in understanding this principle has also helped me on my spiritual journey. Because uh, non-separation in the environmental area, they would call interconnected. Everything is interconnected. And it's fascinating how we influence each other. Just even here on Zoom, uh, we are a group now of five, six people on this Zoom link. And we influence each other with our facial expressions, with our energy. And our energy is influenced by what we did this morning. And our morning is influenced by what we did last night and how our night went. And that is influenced by what we breathe, what we eat. So we are in constant uh, interconnectedness, influencing each other. So then, of course, when I understand this principle in, in a deep way, I would be very careful how I influence others and influence the nature environment around me. And when I feel this close connection and interconnectedness, I also have this closer feeling, feeling of guardianship or care and compassion. Because it would be like that, that's what you feel close to, you care more for. So when I'm able to feel close for all living entities, nature, animals, people, I increase my ability to care for it. And I will be very careful with my thoughts and actions in that way. And <clears throat> we started Brahma Kumari's Environment Initiative in 2009. And it was um, one of the major climate change conferences came to Copenhagen in 2009. And we started to prepare our Environment Initiative and our main principle was a twofold initiative. One was to green our own institution, which you rightly said, Gabriella, turned out to be a massive job. And the other one is to advocate, is to share the importance of the inner dimension of your mindset, of your attitude to the wider world and the stakeholders in the environment field. Um, and of course, this environment, we change, this a change in consciousness and awareness have to lead, lead to action. So this is why Brahma Kumaras have also been very successful in the conferences because we have translated our awareness change into action in a major way. We have uh, the huge solar energy and renewable technology projects and installation and research going on, mostly in India. And, uh, but also in the retreat centers now around the world, we see more and more use of renewable energy. And we have our sustainable yogic farming um, way of life, where we encourage the farmers to embrace this principle of interconnectedness and peace in general. So if awareness change leads to concrete action, People will believe you, maybe we will believe ourselves. And of course, part of action is also to change your lifestyle and to change um, my habits of meditation and diet, etc. In our first conference, when I participated here in 2009, I saw the need of peace for the environmentalists and the activists. And I realized how stressful it is to work for the environment. You see, all statistics are going the wrong way. Whenever there comes a new report from the IPCC, the curves are just going the, the wrong way all the time. The curves are just showing increased pollution. And 
uh, the curves are showing more feedback loops from nature. They are showing more extreme weather events. And the more you know about this, the more stressful it is to see that, well, everything goes the wrong way, but very little action is happening. And of course, some of the NGOs and civil society also get less and less funding from the governments and less and less speaking time in the public arena. So it's a very stressful job to work for the environment. So I, we started to support them with meditation, some spiritual chit chat here and there, and just some personal coaching on how to look after yourself. And I saw that, well, here is a direct need for spirituality. And that need has actually increased over the years in a major way. Um, he has to keep, need to keep an eye on the time. So, um, so this has increased and now we find in the climate change conference, people are very stressed and anxiety is increasing reading the news of the environment. So yes, we are preparing to go to COP16 in Glasgow and you are most welcome to follow us because many of the programs will, programs will now be online. So we have a physical exhibition, but those exhibitions are also uh, virtual nowadays. And this year they are focused on renewable energy and the energy transition, which will decide our future, which is one of our topics. And we have some press conferences and side events in the actually COP conference and they are called Compassionate Leadership Towards a Sustainable World or Increase Resilience to Meet the Future. And we have some workshops with the Civil Society Forum and what some of them are called Local Heroes or Uniting Hearts to Heal the World. And we work together with many other organizations. So, um, yeah, I think my time is up actually, and uh, I'm looking forward to engage with all of you. Thank you. It's lovely, Sonia. Thank you. It's a great overview and um, very informative and so great to see what's happening at COP26, which you've got lined up for you there. Um, it, was, um, it was very um, insightful to listen to you you know, your metamorphosis of how you moved from uh, not really understanding the connection between consciousness, <clears throat> excuse me, and your thinking, and, and how that changed, you know, just with engagement with others and sharing ideas and so on. I'm wondering how it was for you, Carolyn and Valerian, how did you come to understand that there's a huge amount of power in our thoughts and, um, and the therefore so important that they're channeled in the right direction? How did that come about for, for both of you? Actually, Sonia will probably remember as well when um, I remember when in Copenhagen it was the first time the Ramakumaris were there at the COP for the climate. And we had written about um, on our um, stand uh, about consciousness and climate. And I remember people were passing and they were looking at what we had written with a bit of a puzzled face. <laughs> and it was so easy to catch them if they were looking because they really didn't see the connection. And uh, every time we, we kind of worked it out with them. And I loved the aha moment in their eyes. And I loved the fact that it became, like uh, Sonia was saying, something that UNESCO took as well afterwards. So you can see how when you are pioneering on a topic, and it's an important and essential one, minds do shift. Mm -hmm. Not enough, not quick enough either, but they do. Thank you. Carolyn, what about you? How did you come to understand that connection between um, you know, your consciousness and what you're thinking and the impact that that has vibrationally on the environment. Uh, was it anything in particular or was it something that you were just surrounded with and, and picked up or? 
Well, I think I, um, I started a long time to change things on the outer level. Like as a young person, I was a political activist and really fighting against different things, which were, I felt going very wrong in the world, um, starting from atomic energy, but also the, the environmental destruction. And um, so I engaged politically and, and, and as was said earlier, um, tried to make my voice heard. However, I found that um, there wasn't much progress as we can see with the climate change conferences and all the negotiations, it's the progress is quite slow. Um, and then I, I did had a very personal experience on a demonstration where um, for the first time I encountered a different dimension inside myself and the power of our consciousness, which, which can be released because I was challenged by um, justice and, and saw a lot of injustice. Anyhow, I, I don't want to share this story here in detail, but it just, it was a very personal um, experience to go to my limits of mm. trying to change something outside, from the outside, and then um, discovering the inner dimension and how this, as Sonia beautifully shared, is interconnected with um, the way we behave, with our lifestyles. And so it, it made total sense to me that I have to start actually changing myself first before I try to change politics or systems and so on. Wow. Mm. Look, we've got a question that's come in that I'd like to pitch to the three of you, and it, it's, um, it's a bit of a comment as well. It's saying, I can't help but notice the phenomenal increase in anger everywhere. The reactiveness in workplaces, the reactiveness in the home environment, you know, just like the increase in domestic violence and the increase in road raid. And it seems to me to be all big expressions of hot, explosive anger. And I note in parallel the increasing rise in global temperatures. Is there a connection there? Well, to me, uh, this, uh, I also feel this explosion of anger everywhere. But in order to protect myself uh, and not reacting, I would think that these uh, uh, people uh, are, are afraid or insecure. And there is so much to be afraid of and <laughs> so much uh, unpredictability at the moment and ever changing. So even our mm, comfort zones uh, at the workplace or at home are not even there. There is nowhere you can find comfort. And we who have practiced meditation for a long time, hopefully we can find it in ourselves or in our practice. But if you don't have that, I don't know where to find it. So in that way, if I look at it like that, I would, uh, it would help me not to become angry myself, which is the first step. And then I try to stay peaceful and react with love and calm down the situation. But yes, I would connect it to the climate in that way that increased uh, extreme weather events and catastrophes leads to increased fear, therefore leads to increased anger. Right, thank you for that. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, um, the the use of meditation. And I think both you, Sonia and Carolyn have talked about the, uh, the personal impact of that change process of coming to understand the connection between our consciousness and thoughts and, and climate change and, and the impact on the environment. And also about, um, you know, the, the stress that we experience, that many people experience as they work in this field of um, environmental change and and not wanting to get despondent at the curve going the wrong way, as you said, Sonia. Um, what about a meditation practice? Can you just talk a little bit about a meditation practice as a way of, um, you know, preventing that personal burnout or that the personal tragedy that you can feel, that each one of us can feel when we look at what's going on around us? And maybe we could do a meditation as well. So just some comment about that. Would you or shall I? Okay, I can start. Um, so um, I, I also like the, the question about the anger and it uh, has a connection to um, meditation, the sense that meditation really can help us to look deeper 
like anger is a, a secondary um, emotion and climate change is a secondary <laughs> uh, effect. There is something beyond below that um, which has caused anger and climate change. And meditation really uh, is for me a key competence of reflection to step back and look at what is below, what has created this anger, this environmental um, disaster. And, and so there we come more and more to the seed, the, the core of, of the problem. And, and that's actually what, what, where we can also find solutions. I also wanted to add one thing to, on top of what my two friends have said is the whole aspect of imbalance. There is imbalance in matter. But if you look at the cause of this imbalance, I think you can see very easily that the human way of life and the human frame of mind is at the root of wanting too much, wanting too much money, consuming too much, no respect, no reflection, no, you know, and it's a pattern of our civilization. People think it's their right to consume, and we can see it when they come out of the lockdown now. And when they can't, it drives them into a state of inner uh, frustration or anger. So meditation definitely brings the capacity to look onto your inner world. And then from there, you can look with kindness onto the outer world, whether people who are subjected to their own emotional imbalance or nature who is a consequence of this state of affair. Wow, that's very powerful, isn't it? Um, my, a very powerful example of my inner security manifests as um, disrespectful or overconsumption on the physical, in the physical world, you know, in action. And if I'm feeling internally peaceful, then I'm engaging respectfully with the environment and each other. That's what you're saying there, Valerian. Is that what? Mm. Yes, definitely. Yeah, that's lovely. Thanks for answering those questions. Um, Sonia, would you like to introduce the meditation that you've selected for us to, to listen to tonight, today? Yeah, I've selected a, a meditation that I hope all of you will enjoy. So uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a video with some images from nature. And uh, it's an introduction to connect the inner world with the outer world. So I would just say, uh, lean back in your chairs and enjoy. In my mind, I go to a place in nature, a place of greenery and peace. In my thoughts, I emerge the wind and I can hear the leaves of the tree moving in the breeze. The wind whispers secrets in my ear and I understand. I can feel the sunshine on my face, softly warming my heart and soul. The birds are chirping in the background and singing songs of happiness and joy. I emerge the feeling of belonging to the planet, to nature, to the animals and all living beings. I feel safe in being forever connected to this global family of all living beings and being connected to the world around me.
I will remember this moment if I ever lose hope for our common future of harmony for all. Oh, that was lovely, Sonia. Thank you for um, for creating that meditation for us. And and if if our viewers would like to check that meditation out again and listen to it once again, it's called Being Connected, and you'll find the link to it in the chat box. There's a website echo.brahmakamaris.org, which is also in the chat box, and there's a number of meditations and resources on that website for you to enjoy as well. And as Sonia said, you know, the statistics on the erosion and pollution of our planet, um, you know, it can, it can feel overwhelming at times and it may be easy to think, well, what can I do? Um, do I have any agency or any power as an individual? I thought I'd read you something from a book that was written by Carmen Warrington, our speaker on the last uh, episode of Open Your Eyes to the Universe. It's from her book, Today I Am. And the extract is, uh, today I am a raindrop. Compared to the ocean, a single raindrop seems insignificant, ridiculously small and inconsequential. But in the thirsty desert, a single raindrop is precious, life-giving and vitally important. To give something when and where it is needed is what really counts. This is truly a valued gift. Is our world an ocean of peace or a desert? Even though I am only a single drop, every drop of peace counts. I do make a difference. So something to consider that, yes, there's a key takeaway in all of that. It's that I can make a difference, and collectively we can make a difference. So I'd like to check in now with Valerian. Um, I introduced Valerian just briefly, but I'd like to tell you a little bit more about her. She's one of the Brahma Kumari representatives in Geneva, and she's been a contributing member with the climate change conferences since I think about 2009. Uh, Valerian's particularly interested in the power of spirituality and faith. She's active in the Interfaith Liaison Committee and the UNFCCC Secretariat, and is also a co-founder of the Geneva Interfaith Forum on Climate Change, Environment and Human Rights. Now that's an informal group of faith-based NGOs reaffirming the importance of ethics and the responsibility of each individual and nation to care for the earth and address climate change and its impact. 
Lyrians also produced radio programs on the theme of culture of peace and the effects of spiritual awareness. Since 1992, Valerian's been involved in the ecological movement, raising public awareness about the impact of our relationship with ourselves and the environment on sustainability. So Valerian, really looking forward to listening to you about the role of faith-based organizations in the Convention of Paris, of parties, sorry. And also we'd like to know about the Geneva Interfaith Forum on Climate Change, Environment and Human Rights. So welcome to Welcome to Universe and um, looking forward to your conversation. Thank you so much uh, for your introduction and uh, also for inviting me to this conversation. Um, I think it's a very timely and important one. So thanks for creating it as well. Well, when we initially talked also, Gabrielle, you had asked me to explain a little bit our relationship with the United Nations, because I think it's not always easy to understand when you're not working there. Um, so Bama Kumari is an international non-governmental organization called NGO with the United Nations, accredited with general and consultative status with the economic and social Council, which is really a very high status in the NGO status. So what I would like you to, to hear, what is the task of an NGO? Because we hear about NGOs all the time. So we are supposed to bring our expertise as an organization to the UN, but we are also supposed to bring down all the work that is being done by the UN to our constituency so that there is a mutual awareness. But as an NGO also, we are expected to bring the voices and concerns of the constituencies we represent, but also of civil society at large to the UN's attention. And when I say UN attention, we have to visualize that in order to do this, for the UN and the countries, because the states, they are our partner at the UN. They're the main partners at the UN. So we have to find other NGOs who share similar concerns and perspectives and visions in order to make our advocacy work stronger. Because only then will the voices we bring seem to be relevant to the countries. So if we want these voices to be heard, we have to make sure we look like we share many voices. So the UN is constantly creating international laws, responding to the present challenges of the world and facing security in New York, human rights in Geneva. So as the NGO, we have the task to follow the processes that are happening within the COP, at the Human Rights Council, at the General Assembly, and to bring different options and alternatives and new cons and our concerns to the states. And as you already know, many states are facing many different political, economical, environmental issues and challenges. So they sometimes would very gladly forget about <laughs> the need of making the needed changes for climate change or human rights. So when I first became um, part of the UN in Geneva, I realized that we needed to bring uh, the story of people and bring the story of concern about the violations of people's rights in the case of human rights um, and climate change. Because you see, climate change, it takes away people's food, people's lives, people's habitat, people's dignity, people's wealth, people's capacity to communicate amongst each other. So it is a human rights issue, but the UN works in silos. So they concerned, they thought 
climate change was further UNFCCC and human rights was Geneva. So we kind of built a bridge between the two. And I'm glad to say that it's a success story because last month we finally got what we called a resolution and a special mandate of a professional that will look at the impact of climate change on human rights. It took us 10 years of advocacy work, of slowly making our voice heard. And in that process of 10 years, many other organizations took this at heart and made a big difference. So when we were at the UN uh, COP in um, in uh, in uh, Poland, um, the relationship with Christiana Figueres, who was the secretary of the UNFCCC then, was very clear about the need to engage the heart into the processes. And as you can imagine for us, we are, as human rights and also faith organizations, we are looking at people's situation, their suffering, and we want to bring that to the conversation so that people aren't put in danger any further. So for me, working then with the interface, because that's how she saw the voice of the heart, uh, I became part of this little committee of people representing the interface to the UNFCCC. And it was really, it's a learning curve for me because, you know, we, there is many different faith-based organizations present at the UN, but they all do different work. They do a lot of, um, environmental work in terms of uh, relief, in terms of advocacy, in terms of policies. But what we need to look at is also how we can always uh, come together and give equal voices to the people from the South, because like this COP, for instance, people from the South, their voices would hardly be represented. So. Um, one of the things I'm part of the organization of is called the Talanoa Dialogue. It will be in Glasgow on the 31st. And in that dialogue, what we want to bring is people's voices. And we'll create a big call with everybody's contribution and bring that to the UNFCCC, bring that to the to these countries so that hopefully the voices of everyone and of Mother Nature is heard. So for me, it's been an amazing, an amazing learning curve and always trying to see how I can do more for others because working with the interface also means you see the human family. You know, it's the whole human family and you see the virtues of each one wanting to bring the spirit of solidarity and compassion and love and help and one other thing that has happened to me personally with the cops is that it's at the level of advocacy it's so frustrating because you see the hundred things that the cops should decide every year that aren't decided so when you come out all the people there are all the people working they are disheartened, basically. So the way I have every year tried to address that was by creating spiritual tools for myself, for nature, for other people, whether meditation commentaries or other practical things that were contemplative and that helped me process this amazing energy of um, frustration, <laughs> but love, you know, if you don't care, you're not frustrated. So it's also very interesting to learn that it's because you care, but you don't care properly <laughs> that you get frustrated. So it's an amazing um, experience of working with so many brothers and sisters all over the world from different faiths and backgrounds. Thank you very much for listening.
Larian, thank you for that. A great outline of uh, both personally of, of the challenges and working in that area that you work in, but also um, that lovely connection around human rights and environmental rights as well. And as you were, were speaking, I was um, I was reminded of, um, of the appreciation of spirituality within the context of climate change uh, that I witnessed when when I was in Samoa, and I think it was about 2014, something like that, when I attended um, the third United Nations Small Island Developing States Conference, uh, I was with a friend, Maureen O'Connor, and I. And, you know, of course, the Pacific Basin, um, you know, many of the, um, not many, but a lot of the Pacific Islands are facing, um, you know, soil erosion and, and land, decreasing land sizes as sea rises um, as as temperatures rise and the sea levels rise as well, and um, yet there was some incredible resilience there in Samoa and a beautiful warm heart that I noted. That um, and when we were delivering our workshops and seminars and things and engaging on, you know, developing a peaceful footprint um, and spirituality and climate change, um, it actually had so much appeal in Samoa that um, the local newspapers, to our surprise you know, gave it um, page one status on the newspaper and the World Bank was page 10. Um, so such a turnaround here. And, and the reason I'm sharing it is because I really did feel that there was something quite compelling about um, coming from a heart space when you look at these big issues that we face. Um, and, and they seem to manage that really, really well there. Uh, and it impacted, it influenced the way the negotiations were happening as well. And even the clothes they were wearing, you know, the suits came off and they were wearing loose flowing yeah, um, Samoan shirts and so on. But one of the questions that's come in here is, um, you know, it, it's, connect, it's connected, it's saying, um, it's with these two questions, what's the connection uh, between contributing and belonging and, and how do we cool down heads and warm up hearts? So I'm wondering if we could have our, our two lovely companions back to share a bit of a dialogue about that. Those two questions that came in, what's the connection between contributing and belonging? And how do we cool down heads and warm up hearts? Mm -hmm. yeah, I wanted to say that uh, when you do work with all these different people from different faiths, you see that spirituality has no border spirituality belongs to all and people's hearts is in each one's chest and can create a change and so there is a sense of belonging that really nurtures uh, <clears throat> the work because one of the other aspects that is very important in terms of interfaith is making sure that people still have hope and enthusiasm because this work is, is, as Sonia was saying, you know, the IPCC numbers every time show you <coughs> the danger. But how to face this with a good, open, clean, hopeful heart. So I let my two friends uh, comment. So um, the question, as far as I remember, was um, the warm heart and, and then the, maybe the feeling of separation and, and anger and confusion. Um, I wonder how the, the experience of life, of being disconnected from the environment, but also from people around me, um, kind of contributes to acting without perceiving anymore what it, my actions do to the other and therefore also lack of compassion and a lack of being able to step into the shoes of the other to see the world and, and everything from other people's perspective or from a broader perspective in general. So there's, um, yeah, separation and disconnection, um, I think, is a key problem here, where we somehow don't really understand and experience anymore um, how we influence each other and how we maybe overstep boundaries of one another 
and the environment. But if we get in touch again and open our heart, then it's a very natural process to care for others and ourselves and everyone. Yeah, and um, Karin, I will, uh, I will continue from there because um, I think when, if you have a feeling of belonging, uh, you wouldn't think about contributing because uh, uh, that you do naturally. It's like if you have a family, you don't think I contribute this much time and this much money. You know, it's just one unit. <laughs> and uh, you share uh, as a very natural process, as you said. And I uh, also liked what uh, Valerian was touching on, uh, working in cooperation with partners and friends and other colleagues, because nothing do exist in isolation and nothing works in isolation. So we have to work together, even we want it or not, because there is no other way. And spirituality and uh, sustainability actually is working together, because one way of uh, describing sustainability would be how a gardener looks after his garden, and he wouldn't look after one flower, because he would look after all flowers. So we have to work in that way. And regarding head and heart. Figueras also said, Valera, you will remember that uh, to use the head only has proven not to work because nothing is changing. So we have to use the heart. And uh, Greta Thunberg, who you all know also, she has very beautifully talked about blah, 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 blah recently. Everyone is just saying blah, blah. But at the same time, Greta is saying, listen to science. Science will tell you what you need to know. And that is using our head. So we have to use our head to listen to science, but then we have to use the heart to translate it to action. And in terms of opening up the heart, I mean, I'm sure there are many beautiful ways of doing that and many good methods and deep things but for me there's only one thing that works and it is to start to be kind to myself you know just that negative self-talk is just absolutely forbidden and never there is any reason to be negative towards the self and if I can learn that then I think my heart opens up to every living being in a very natural way I think this belonging for me is something so beautiful, really. Yeah. It brings the sense of oneness and it also brings the full kindness, like uh, mm. Sonia was saying just now, but also, you know, you start feeling responsible. You're not just responsible for your small little budget for the months, but you know, we, we have a huge budget with our planet and every little drop, as you were saying in this beautiful saying from Carmen, uh, every drop counts, every mm -hmm. moment of silence, every moment of love. And for some people, it would take the form of political action. Some people, it would take the form of a writing poetry. Some people will just meditate. Some will change the way they eat in order to not contribute to more uh, carbon to the planet. So I think it's a wonderful analogy to see the, the oneness. And the earth really reminds us of that. And faith-based organizations have had traditionally the duty of bringing the morals and the ethics to the table. You know, it's their role from the beginning of their creation. So I think it's a good chance also for us to bring spirituality back into faith all the time. And the Brahma Kumaris are really keen on spirituality. Mm. It's lovely. Um, we do have a few more questions, but I'm going to save them for the Q&A. Um, and what I'll do now, Valerian, is invite you into uh, a meditation space with us all. And if you'd like to lead us in a meditation, it would be gorgeous. 
Thank you. So I would like to invite you to sit comfortably and to contemplate the world that is surrounding you, the air coming into your lungs, the freshness of this air on the skin, and the air coming out of your lungs. And in this awareness, I appreciate with gratitude this nectar of life, shared by the plants and all Mother Nature, allowing me to keep alive. allowing me to be healthy. And now I go within my inner world, within my inner dimension, inside me, there is a whole universe as well, a whole potential potential of peace, potential of love, a potential of kindness. Every thought matters. Every thought is a drop of goodness that I can contribute. And yes, matter does resonate. And other people's awareness also resonate to each powerful good thought we utter into this universe. Each one of us is like a little powerful industry of thoughts and feelings and what comes out of me is my choice and in silence I pay attention to each drop of creation that is coming out of me making it full of gratitude life itself, for matter, for being alive myself, for this amazing potential that I can encounter in the depth of my being. At each moment of inner connectedness, my heart dances with joy. And in this dance, I invite Mother Nature. I invite in this dance all my brothers and sisters, humans, but also all other forms of life. And whenever I want, I can go back within the universe of my inner world, connect with the source of power and love within, and shine 
hope, love and beauty out to our world. Thank you, Valerian. It was a, a lovely movement into the inner space, the world of the inner space. Thank you for sharing that one. Um, you can never really underestimate the power of meditation and prayer. And one of the things that I'm thinking about at the moment is the sustainable yogic farming. And there's an opportunity for you to find out a little bit more about that um, by checking out the chat box where we've got some references where they were using the power of meditation to um, grow crops, sustainable crops in India. Uh, so a lovely connection there. But I'd like to now um, turn our attention to our third speaker, and that's Carolyn Froud. So Carolyn works in a transdisciplinary research group at the Institute of Advanced Sustainable, uh, at, at the Institute of IASS, that's the Institute of Advanced Sustainability Studies in Potsdam, Germany. And this is an amazing institute. It conducts research with the goal of understanding, advancing and guiding processes of society or change towards sustainable development. Their researchers, of which Carolyn is one, collaborate with diverse actors from science, policymaking and public administration, as well as business and civil society to develop a common understanding of sustainability challenges and generate potential solutions. The Institute pursues a research approach that is transformative, transdisciplinary and cooperative and very co-creative. Now, Carolyn holds a diploma in education science and studied philosophy and social science and psychology at the Free University in Berlin. And her research interests include designing processes and spaces, engaging with people's beliefs, values, worldviews, emotions and intentions understood as leverage points for transformation towards a sustainable society. Her special interest lies in the interconnectedness and you've, um, the interconnectedness of the inner and the outer transformation. And she's already sort of been speaking a little bit about that this evening. And how, for example, transforming and cultivating states of consciousness, attitudes, behaviors, and lifestyles can support the transition towards a sustainable society. So Carolyn has been involved in, um, in UN conferences, such as the Commission on the Status of Women and the United Nations Federation Convention on Climate Change. Carolyn, I can remember when I was in COP25 with you in Madrid, and I uh, saw firsthand the work the Institute was doing on in that whole relational transformation space for delegates and negotiators. And it was really hitting the mark in terms of encouraging delegates and attendees at the COP to visualize a better world and to connect in a very personal way with nature and the environment. So um, what inspiring and fascinating action-focused research work you do. Tell us about your research on the interconnectedness of inner and outer transformation and uh, what you're up to at the Convention of Parties. Thank you so much, uh, Gabriel, for actually creating this beautiful space here. It's um, actually connected to what um, the Institute I'm working for is doing at the COP because um, it's a reflective place, a space. But let me start giving a little bit of a context and also connect to firstly what Sonia and Valerian has said. Um, so that, um, yeah, so Sonia already described beautifully um, the interconnectedness be between our consciousness and behavior, which is a cause for the understanding, um, but somehow totally lost um, in our day-to-day -day life and our modern Western world, and especially in science and politics. And Valerian very nicely shared how faith-based organizations have been working hard to bring in the soft, the, the hard aspect, um, the feeling aspect into this very um, 
um, tense and and not very friendly environment of UN conferences or multilateral conferences, um, such as as the climate change conference. So um, it's interesting that I mean, following from there, I would like to complement this uh, by bringing in. Um, the angle of science and politics and, and see how um, traditionally um, have uh, understanding have has been produced here and and solutions have been produced here but not really led to somewhere um, which, which is really transformative and then i like to touch upon um, a relational understanding of transformation and and the research i'm doing um, so for for many centuries, um, neither the environmental movement as I shared as an activist, nor sustainability science have been acknowledging spiritual indigenous knowledge and what these can contribute to global and scientific and systemic transformation, both in terms of having a um, more holistic understanding, um, but also in terms of practicing that really change us as people and our societies and finally, our systems. So in these areas, um, people were trying hard to um, change something only on the outer level, I gathered a huge amount of knowledge and amazing technical solutions. However, for decades, neither scientific knowledge nor political frameworks like the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, or the Paris Agreement really has led countries and societies towards a fundamental change uh, transformation. This is not at all surprising from a spiritual perspective because uh, we, as we have heard already, um, are very aware um, that you cannot only change things on the outer level if you not also change your worldview, your consciousness and, and the way you um, live. So um, since science, technique and politics and many other areas have ignored the inner dimension for a very long time. Um, that's why we cannot really um, see much change. And I think actually this has come from the era of enlightenment um, where uh, West, in the Western world, very consciously a uh, religion, uh, spirituality, philosophy have been separated from politics and science. And, partly for very good reasons, because um, uh, religion sometimes had become, or often had become manipulative and a tool to suppress people. However, it's like kind of kicking out the spiritual dimension completely. It's like throwing out the baby with the bath water and uh, we go on to the other extreme, um, like analysis and, and rationality have been totally overestimated in there what they can do um, in terms of change in feelings, and the impact of feelings and perception and consciousness have been ignored. Probably the only area which has, um, Im has been aware and using the impact of the inner dimension to a certain degree has been media and marketing. However, again, in a more manipulative way and making more um, um, production and, and selling things better. Um, so now with the escalating climate crisis, more and more scientists and researchers have started to include multiple perspectives and various forms of knowing and not just scientific views. One of these areas is called transdisciplinary research and that's what the Institute I'm working for is um, helping to develop further. And um, here on the one side, it's a participatory reason to include others and different perspectives um, within, within transdisciplinary research. But it's not only that, it's um, much more than that, than non-academic voices uh, to include them, but it's, it's rather an understanding that our sense-making capacity needs to open and broaden for deeper dimension, a deeper dimension of understanding. And you can say it's a more holistic 
sense making and then more harmonious world perception that we actually need. And we have been touching upon that as well in terms of you know, connecting with the other and perceiving boundaries and therefore also having compassion when um, other people are suffering or the environment is being destroyed. So um, there have been practices um, in, in the past in different contexts. And I think one of the person of which I really um, acknowledge and, and uh, admire a lot is David Bohm and his uh, dialogue format. And here it's again coming from an indigenous um, people's practice where a group of people connects together, sits down and meets in a way which is beyond um, their task or their roles and just shares what they perceive and see. And everyone is listening. It's a listening practice, wholeheartedly. And with that, it's kind of you hear more and more and more perspectives, very different perspectives and perceptions of, of other people. And it's like your own consciousness, your own perspective opens and becomes wider. And that's one of the things we um, do at the climate change conferences. We create spaces where people can encounter with one another in a way which is more human, you can say, um, where it's beyond their agendas, what they have to you know, advocate for, but just as human beings who are all sitting in the same boat. And it's interesting to witness that um, here we can, we can see moments of transformation when people suddenly um, step out of their silo view and see more. And very fundamental, like very basic um, values and, and um, things which connect us uh, have been, are emerging again, which are actually natural to us. So this is one of the things um, we, we offer at the COP. And it's also, of course, a critique on, on how the COP has been organized. Um, it's not very, it's not a supporting a culture of collective thinking and a, a culture of, um, you know, really thinking out of the box. Um, so that's what we are trying to do there. Um, it requires um, respect uh, a lot for one another and an openness and willingness to see things new, which is not always easy for people because we are usually um, like to think in the way we are used to think. Um, but I think the need of the time is really pushing us there. And once you engage or we, we engage people in, this, in these dialogues, um, they also see that there is something suddenly touched and nurtured within, which has been unnurtured for a long time. And this is a very human and beautiful um, part within us. So I'd like to um, pause here and invite you to just take that moment while you are sitting in front of your computer or your mobile phone and listening to this um, this dialogue here and see how you experience yourself listening, connecting with all of us in the moment of awareness, how that changes your normal thinking. It's a very simple practice, but very, very um, valuable, something which we should cultivate every day. It's a form of meditation, but it's a also a practical form of um, not looking through belief, your, your beliefs, sorry, um, but rather looking at your beliefs and worldviews. And that's a different thing. You step back, you have a, like, uh, you observe rather than you're in that mindset and, and belief system. And this is when you, when you open and listen and, and, and open yourself up for different perspectives. So we have actually um, also produced some scientific papers on that, um, of the culture of um, being and working together. 
a more connected one and how that can be created. We are now moving to a new research phase in our work where we look at what practices and approaches help creating these kind of safe spaces and um, these, these um, spaces where deeper insights can emerge and transformative shifts can happen. And um, maybe there is a chance to share these papers and there's also policy brief to the United Nations um, Framework Convention on Climate Change, how a COP can maybe be organized a little bit differently. So I think I stop here. Um, I'm not sure how we are with time, but please, uh, you can also ask or, or pitch on something a bit more. Yeah, Carolyn, that was wonderful. We actually um, had some questions coming in around what needs to happen in your view to move the COP conference forward in terms of negotiators. And I think you've pretty much answered that in, in what you were saying. So um, very insightful. Thank you for that. Um, it would be good to hear from all of you. Um, there's two questions that I think would be useful in the light of what Carolyn's been saying. Carolyn has been saying. Um, and one is, does the environment impact our thinking ability or what we humans are thinking impacts the environment? So, um, well, I think both. It's an interconnectedness, as it was mentioned. Um, but if we, if we think about how to shift around the course of development, then the, the one thing which we can influence is, of course, our inner um, world, our, our thoughts and feelings. And by starting, for example, to connect with our inner self, first of all, because the disconnection from the environment is also a disconnection from ourselves and, um, and then other people. So that's like the leverage point for change is within myself. But you can also say that now the environmental crisis kind of forces us to look for this other dimension which we have ignored for a long time. What do you think, um, Sonia and Valerian? I was actually remembering our dear daddy Janki when she came up with this amazing little phrase, when I change, the world changes. Uh, it really shows the impact that um, we want to have can only happen if we create an impact in our own selves. And um, we can change the way we think, as Carolyn so brilliantly explained. And we, we then have the capacity to bring that also into practicality. So you can see the way we eat, we can change that. We can change the way we consume, like... Sonia was saying earlier on, we can change our relationship with nature. We can change also our relationship of, with ourselves, like this kindness that we already have spoken about. And I think the impact um, is, is great onto the world out there, but also it makes us better voices to advocate change. Thank you. It's a very good question. And at the moment, I am doing a lot of decluttering in my house and in other houses. <laughs> and I realized that uh, your local environment in your house, how much it affects uh, the mind. And uh, I think this is a good exa example of this both ways. You know, my cluttered mind creates a cluttered flat and opposite if I start from the outside. I declutter my house and my wardrobe and my cupboards and everything. And then it actually decluttered my mind and left much more space. And in this space, I have a space to go deep into some of the aspects and space to look at myself and create some deep changes. So it's always both ways. We are always connected in, in, in every way. And also liked, I want to comment on what uh, um, Carolyn said about sense making. And it has to make sense to us. And I think in order to create a long lasting change, 
uh, it also has to feel good. This uh, feeling good uh, um, feeling <laughs> is what makes you continue with your new habit. Because I can read about the new lifestyle habit or diet habit, but if it doesn't feel right, I will not continue. So here in Copenhagen, when we started the 10 years ago now, not everyone had eco-friendly cleaning products. So we did what everyone else did in, to prepare for the conference. The whole city went green. So we also did here, we changed every way we, we print and how we clean the center. And I thought, I will not say anything to the group uh, afterwards. I will see what happens. So everyone continued to use eco-friendly cleaning products or homemade mm. or very little. And then I asked why, well, it just feels better. You know, there was no direction, no order, no instruction, no group decision. It was just felt better. So this also has to be there. Mm -hmm. And also in this relationship with nature, I can see, you know, when the, when people came out of this, um, uh, of, you know, being in the curfew and all this COVID situation, people just wanted to consume and they wanted nature to give them whatever they wanted that was their, their right, you know. So I think that the climate change is posing us with this question, is, is, is nature a right or is nature more than just a right to consume, but something I need to care for and something I need to respect and value. And it's, it's just a paradigm shift that happens. I, I would like to uh, comment on the question actually in the chat uh, about vegan and vegetarian food um, and why the Brahma Kumaris are not um, promoting uh, stronger veg 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 vegetarian or um, vegan food. Um, and I would like to say that um, that's actually to do, I think, with our understanding of, of transformation. I mean, first of all, we do promote vegan food and I can say from our Ramakumari Center in Berlin, it's 99% vegan. Um, nearly everyone is only taking um, oat milk and stuff like that. But um, we, we have very deeply uh, in, in, in our understanding that we can only promote something um, when I live it myself. Otherwise it's like preaching something which is not real. So as not everyone in the Brahma Kumaris has turned vegan, even though vegetarian is uh, no point of discussion, that's totally clear, um, then it's like something which each one promotes for him or herself or, or says from her own practice. And um, the Brahma Kumaris are having a strong um, root in the Indian culture and there in the Indian diet, you use a lot of milk. So it takes time Culture, culture changes take time, that's very human. And it takes understanding, it takes knowledge, but it takes also um, really the inner effort to, to um, yeah, change your patterns of behavior and your likings. And yeah, Sonia. <laughs> Thank you, very nice. I also wanted to comment on a question in the chat that what can we do? Please give us some action. And actually, you know, uh, it's just out there. <laughs> Environmentally friendly lifestyle is just out there. You can just one click on Google and you're there. And so I don't think we have to wait for each other to tell each other what to do. You know, because if I have to tell you what to do, you will do it as long as I'm around. And when I'm not around, you will not do it anymore if you don't sort of become your own. So no need to wait for anybody else to, to tell them what to do. And Maybe, uh, yeah, one of the things that um, is, is we're moving close to time now, yes. if you could just each of you share one thing that you do um, <laughs> in your regular daily life that you do personally, that you um, understand and feel and completely believe and have faith in that it is contributing um, to a positive impact on the environment. Just, just one thing to share. I think, um, I mean, one practical thing, uh, I decided now from Germany to go to Glasgow via train. And I'm very excited about that. I, I mean, I usually would fly. Um, that's our 
normal way, but it takes me 16, 18 hours, something like that. But I'm so much looking forward to it um, now. It, it was an environmental reason, of course, going to a climate change conference by plane is a bit um, difficult. I mean, it's a bit, uh, doesn't feel good. Um, but um, it, it's really a shift around also to see it as an adventure. It's beautiful. Uh, there's so much, you have more time, you have less stress. And I think that's one reason which of, often gets lost, the opportunity and what you gain from making a change. If you have a city um, with no car traffic, you, you gain so much. You have nice uh, uh, air and, and everything is more calm and so on. So that's my, my very you. soon step. <laughs> Thanks, Carolyn. That's lovely. And what about you, Valeria? Um, one of the things that have always been very sensitive to is um, how I consume. So, for instance, water is, is one of the amazing things that nature provides from us. Uh, and I really try to drink with awareness and to look at the water with all the different messages it's going to bring into my body and to try and align first and create a water that's going to be safe to drink through the power of thoughts. And Emoto's work has been amazing around the impact of water. So um, it's a simple action in it. It's, it's really just a, a reflection and a love story that I want to create. Mm, that's gorgeous. Thank you. Thank you, Valerian. What about you, Sonia? Something that you do every day that you know impacts positively on the environment? Well, I think it's to try to stay happy every day. Gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Look, what we're going to do now is um, have a, uh, a commentary, a meditation with Carolyn. So would you like to get us ready for that, Carolyn? And, and we'll slip into a meditation together. And by the way, there's lots of appreciation coming in through um, through the chat box for the conversation and the insights you've been sharing. But let's do a, a meditation with Carolyn. Thank you. Uh, I invite you to sit and relax and kind of inside step back and breathe. I visualize myself on a nice armchair and sitting inside myself and becoming the observer of all I can perceive right now. I become aware that I am a being, a living being. I am consciousness. I am subtle energy. And my mind calms down more and more. And I feel myself whilst connecting to my inner peace, a resource every one of us has. Stepping back means also to let go. Letting go for a moment of the outer world. Letting go of my ideas, my thoughts, what I want and like. And relax.
I enjoy this pause, which I give to myself right now. I enjoy the company of myself, the being I am. And in the moment of silence, I connect to my heart. and can see the beauty I have inside. The good intentions I have. It appears to me that what is really important to life, what is really important in life, is very simple and it lies there within me. And this is here where I can gain clarity again. When my life seemed to become very complicated, here I can cultivate peace, contentment, inner power. I can nurture myself by connecting with the divine and energy which is alike to the energy of myself. And it just feels good to connect, to reconnect, to deepen, and to allow it to sink deep inside myself. Nurturing myself in this way allows me to need less from outside. It allows me to become free from desires, from narrow opinions, views, but it rather connects me with everyone, all forms of life even. So let's stay in that consciousness, even when we come back into the virtual space for the final part of this beautiful program. Thank you, Carolyn. It was lovely. So one of those very gentle movements into the inner part of our being and, and spending some moments there reflecting. Thank you for that. Well, uh, everyone, it's uh, just about time to close out our session, our episode this evening. And I think we'll play a short two-minute video which summarizes some of the key points about consciousness and climate change and creating a better world that, that our um, three speakers have been 
you know, sharing their experiences about and their insights and their wisdom. So let's have a look at that, that video. It's called Peaceful Footprint. Want to create a better world? Want to live with security, belonging, peace, justice, understanding and respect for all people? All living creatures, nature and the environment? Want to create a peaceful footprint? It starts with my consciousness. Peaceful consciousness leads to peaceful thoughts. Peaceful thoughts lead to kind words. Kind words lead to respectful actions for myself, for all people, for all living creatures, for nature and the environment. Om Shanti. We may have come from many different countries and cultures. Within our hearts, I think, we hold the same vision of a better world, of greater security, peace, justice, understanding and respect for all people. Houses can be built with the bricks, but it is what is in our hearts that builds a lovely home. Once we have seen in the eye of our mind that such a world can and should exist. Make it happen. Make it happen. We can make it happen when I stop taking and consuming more than I need and start giving and receiving. When I stop reacting to others and start responding and serving. When I stop measuring and transacting and start collaborating and sharing. When I stop competing and start cooperating. When I stop depending and start being interdependent. That's when I create a peaceful footprint. And our world becomes a place of giving, receiving, responding, serving, sharing collaborating, cooperating, a place of interdependence. Individual action creates collective action, which lead to collective impact. My peaceful footprint creates a global peaceful footprint. Want to live in a better world? It begins with my peaceful consciousness and my peaceful footprint. <laughs>